Go forward. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. As we always do, let's begin with our prayer. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may, by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection. For the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Cool. <clears throat> Today, Brian is giving the reflection. It's Monday, and so seminary and day on copy of Father Gray. But this is the last time he'll be doing it, uh, because before the next time that his turn would be up, he will already be back in seminary. So something to look forward to, and hopefully it'll be very, very worth treasuring, I think. I, you know, I think so. I like these things. Anyway, let's dig in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, whom taught by the Holy Spirit, we dare to call our Father. Bring, we pray, to perfection in our hearts the spirit of adoption as your sons and daughters, that we may merit to enter into the inheritance which you have promised. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God and follow his ways exactly, to love and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I enjoin on you today for your own good, Think, the heavens, even the highest heavens, belong to the Lord, your God, as well as the earth and everything on it. Yet in his love for your fathers, the Lord was so attached to them as to choose you, their descendants, in preference to all other peoples, as indeed he has now done. Circumcise your heart, therefore, and be no longer stiff-necked. For the Lord, your God, is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who has no favorites, accepts no bribes, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and befriends the alien, feeding and clothing him. So you too must befriend the alien, for you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. The Lord, your God, shall you fear, and him shall you serve. Hold fast to him and swear by his name. He is your glory, he, your God, who has done for you those great and terrible things which your own eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt, 70 strong, and now the Lord, your God, has made you as numerous as the stars of the sky. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord, Jerusalem. Glorify the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. Praise the Lord, Jerusalem. He has granted peace in your borders. With the best of wheat, he fills you. He sends forth his command to the earth, swiftly runs his word. Praise the Lord, Jerusalem. He has proclaimed his word to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has done 
thus for any other nation. His ordinances he has not made known to them. Praise Alleluia. The Lord, Jerusalem. Alleluia, Alleluia. God has called you through the gospel to possess the glory of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. As Jesus and his disciples were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were overwhelmed with grief. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax approached Peter and said, Does not your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. When he came into the house, before he had time to speak, Jesus asked him, what is your opinion, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take tolls or census tax? From their subjects or from foreigners? When he said, from foreigners, Jesus said to him, when the subjects are exempt, but that we may not offend them, go to the sea, drop in a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. Open its mouth, and you will find a coin worth twice the temple tax. Give that to them for me and for you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All right, Brian, please take it away. All right. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, so like uh, most of the reflections or seemingly like most of the reflections I've um, done this summer. This one was kind of tricky to unpack, but once you get into it, it's actually pretty um, some pretty dense material here. And so um, what I plan to do is actually start with the gospel and show how that informs or can inform our reading of the um, first reading from the Old Testament uh, in Deuteronomy. So beginning with the gospel, there is a lot at work here. And the two things that I really wanna focus on are dominion and submission and how they're related to each other. Um, uh, specifically how Christ shows his dominion of, over the world, over creation through his submission, precisely through his submission and how he's able to do that because it's pretty interesting. Um, I will also have um, several side notes because there is a lot to unpack here. Some of them don't really fit into the, um, larger picture, but they're still just kind of interesting, um, specifically about the fish. But um, uh, so yeah, the first part of the gospel is honestly a little awkward for me, um, because it doesn't really seem to kind of fit with this, the, the rest of the pericope. It's like, how does it, it seems like almost two different pericopes in, um, in one. And so like kind of seeing like why, you know, the church split it up this way and why we should understand it um, as these two things going together was kind of an issue with me, but it actually makes sense once you um, really look into it. Um, and uh, and what to keep in mind, it's, it's important to keep in mind that this was only a few verses after the transfiguration. Um, it's in the same chapter and literally just a few verses and speaking of the transfiguration if you ever like go read it in Matthew and just like read it in the context that it exists in um, it's actually kind of funny how you know nonchalant they are about it in a way um, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned um, St. Jerome and how he said that you know like the the gospel isn't as pretty as some of the ancient philosophies and everything like that and the transfiguration is kind of a good example of that because as far as story writing this is a very like climactic moment that's just kind of written almost as an aside the way if you just read the words on the page and it's kind of interesting to think about that it's kind of funny to me when I was uh, looking over this for uh, preparing for this morning um but uh, this is not, the, the first part of the gospel is where he foretells his death. And this is not the first foretelling of his passion and death, but at least in this gospel, this is the first time we say, or we hear that he will be, um, that he will, um, that he will be betrayed by man and suffer death and be resurrected or and resurrect. Whereas before, a couple chapters before, or maybe the preceding chapter, I forget, it's, uh, he tells the disciples that, 
he will um, have to suffer under the elders and the priests and whatnot. And then that's when Peter says, no, I won't allow it. And then he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. It's that famous line. Um, but this time we, he kind of sheds more light on it. Not only will he have to suffer these things, but he will be betrayed, um, handed over to men and suffer death, but will be resurrected. So then we seem we have what seems like a strong pivot because we end that part with the hearing that the disciples are exceedingly uh, sorrowful. Um, and now all of a sudden we're at Capernaum. But um, an interesting thing to note about Capernaum, like the word itself, it means the village of comfort. I think the original was um, Farhanum or something like that, that eventually through the Greeks and everything changed to um, Capernaum, but it originally means the village of comfort. And we see Christ comforting his disciples immediately after um, kind of disturbing them and distressing them with this foretelling of his passion and his death. And this is where I want to um, go into submission. This is where the first submission, uh, the submission comes into. Um, he talks to Peter, it's just like, well, do who pays? And in some translations, he um, subjects is uh, translated as sons. And so it's like, who pays tribute to the king, sons or foreigners? And Peter says foreigners. And the way he says this, it is Christ is, he is the son of God. This is the temple tax. He's very much the son that does not need to pay a tribute. However, so as not to offend anyone, he says, go and pay and find this fish with this coin in this mouth. That's two times worth the temple tax that will count for you and me. And we will do it like that. Um, quick side note there. There's a lesson in prudence there that I think that we can go into further. I haven't really, I don't really have time to go too deep into that, but there is, I think, a very good lesson about prudence there that we should kind of meditate on and think of like on our, on our own when we have time. And so, um, so yeah, we're back to this fish that uh, Peter is asked to bring up. Um, there is a few things I want to talk about. Uh, the dominion through submission thing. Um, Christ submits to paying the tax, but how does he do it? He does it by showing that he has absolute dominion over the earth and over the world. He says, go find this fish and there will be the tax, the amount that we need in there because I am Christ and I have this uh, power. I have this lordship over the earth. But then there are also like several different ways to read the fish. If you remember from my um, last talk on uh, parables, I'd said there are tons of different interpretations you can do. And this is kind of parabolic in nature. It's not a parable itself, but there are different interpretations. And I kind of want to show, share with you what some of the church fathers uh, thought of this, because it's just kind of a, uh, it enriches the reading, enriches the history of our church. Um, so uh, St. Hilary, likens the fish to Saint Stephen, the first martyr. He says, um, Peter fished Stephen out from the sea, so to speak, and from his mouth came the treasure of good preaching. So he sees the treasure that was found in the fish's mouth as a good thing. Saint Jerome is a little different, or actually very different. He takes a different interpretation. He says the fish taken from the sea is the first Adam that is taken up by the second Adam, and the money actually represents the sin that we get rid of through confession. So there are lots of different things that you can do with this fish. And it's just such a weird story that it's it's hard not to get go down too many rabbit holes with it because it's fun. Um, but anyway, back to dominion through submission. So when at the beginning of the gospel, remember, he said that he will uh, be betrayed, he will suffer death, and he will be resurrected. He, he will resurrect. So foretelling his resurrection, um, this is very much that it, he it, it foretells like he will submit himself to be betrayed to the punishments of man. But through that submission, he will show his dominion again, not over just the earth and the heavens, but over death itself. He is Lord over all of it. And death has no grip on him. So through submitting to death by his own volition, remember, he can leave the passion. He can leave the cross whenever he wants, but he doesn't. By doing that, through his own volition, he shows, he brings about this revelation of God as true master over death and true uh, you know, lover of us who wants us to be united with him. So this is very much a comfort after the foretelling of his death. Christ shows his disciples in a very real way how much power he actually has. And, and yes, okay, 
So that is um, the, the main takeaway that I want to take, um, that I want to look at today from the gospel, this submission through, I'm sorry, dominion through submission. Now I want to go to the Old Testament. This is one of the big ones. It is, you know, the great commandment. You should love your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Doing this, loving God with all our heart and with all our soul, and because of Christ and the work that he has done, this is how we become sons of God. Christ opened that door for us. And remember, um, the sons do not have to pay tribute, uh, as, as Christ said in the um, latter part of the gospel. So just as kings do not ask their sons for tribute, neither does God. We have access to the heavens, and Deuteronomy even says, like, even the highest heavens, because the Lord has dominion over all of that. So are following commandments kind of a tribute in themselves? Yes, but also eh, kind of, it's, it's, it's a little more nuanced than that, because Moses said, I enjoin on you today for your own good in the, in the Deuteronomy. He said, you need to do this for your own good. And that is very much what the commandments are for. The commandments aren't for God. The commandments he gives us are not for him. They are for us. But neither are they these really like kind of list of demands or something like that. But they also kind of show us like if you want true joy, like lasting joy that cannot be taken away from you, this is what you should do. They're really kind of like guidestones in a way. Um, uh, and so the, 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 there's a really good um, kind of interesting meditation on the commandments that you can do with this reading. And, you know, when we talk about loving God, is that in itself kind of a sacrifice? Well, yes, it actually involves a lot of sacrifice. But the closer you get to God, the more you realize like what you are giving up doesn't really do it for you anymore. For instance, you know, last year I was on um, a pretty strict lockdown at uh, um, seminary and that allowed me a lot of time to pray, meditate, study and work on my relationship with God. Still at the end of the year, I was ready to get back and do the things that I missed doing, being, you know, free. But then even when I came here and like they were kind of fun to do, but they still didn't quite have the same ring to it. They didn't really have this. I didn't get the same joy out of it that I used to. And that's simply because I'm not the same person I was when I enjoyed those things before seminary. I have changed through trying to um, conform my life to God as best I can right now. You do change. And so the things that you used to enjoy, yes, you kind of are sacrificing them in a way, but neither do they really have the same ring to them they, they don't have the, you don't get the same joy out of them um because what you realize you were looking for in them is actually god that's what you were looking for that's what you were striving after so loving god does involve sacrifices but what you get in return is something much better because it's exactly what you were looking for in all these things um so and back to um one more thing on the old testament uh, Moses has that line, you know, just as we were aliens in Egypt, we are aliens on earth as well. When it comes to the whole king and subject thing, I kind of looked at it um, from a spiritual point of view so far, but there is a very literal point of view, like, you know, he's the king, you're, um, you know, if you're a subject, you don't have to, or a son, you don't have to pay tribute. If you're a foreigner, you do and whatnot and have, and what have you. Um, by kind of attaching this reading to the Old Testament reading as the church does in today's um, lectionary, we kind of like kind of see this idea of the Christian as the pilgrim underscored. The, the idea that we are pilgrims on this earth, that we are sojourners on this earth, and that life is temporary. It's 70 years for some of most of us, 80 years for the strongest of us, as the psalm says. Um, you, you know, it, it is fleeting. It is passing. We're not here for long. And most of all of humanity has been forgotten, honestly. Most people have been forgotten. And so... Um, and it's really important to remember that that is very, very deep to our religious, to our faith and to our relationship with God. Well, we're not, but we won't be forgotten if we truly conform our lives to God and truly strive to become children of God as he has invited us to do and as he has allowed us to do. And, um, you know, uh, through through the life, death and resurrection of Christ, we are able to have access to God and the highest heavens even. Um, and if we do that, our lives, our names will be written in the book of life, and we will not be forgotten. 
Um, one of the most beautiful stories I love is uh, the, the thief on the cross is just simply remember me in heaven, Christ. Christ, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's an interesting thing to think about. What does it mean to be remembered in heaven? Uh, you know, probably something, I'll, you know, to be alive is to be living. You know, you can meditate on that all day. Um, so to recapitulate, we see in the gospel um, Christ's lordship, his dominion over the earth, his power over the earth, and how he is able to express that precisely through submission. Um, and in the Old Testament, that we, informs our way of reading the Old Testament because we see how loving God makes us sons of God and how it opens up to us the, the heavens and even the highest heavens, as Moses says. Um, so that is all I have to say on that today. But before I kick it over to um, the prayers, I do want to say thank you for letting, for allowing me to do this, for listening to me um, this whole summer. It's been very good for me. I hope it's been good for you. Um, it's definitely been um, a great practice in finding my voice, so to speak, when it comes to preaching, um, which I'm still working on. So thank you for being my guinea pigs and, you know, um, putting up with some of the, some of the things that I was kind of exploring and some of the projects I was doing. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely have. And I hope to log into coffee with Father Gray every so often, like last year from seminary. So, all right, I'm done. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. No, it's great. It is very exciting to hear what you are thinking about because it matters to us. Cool. <clears throat> Before going on, I also just want to mention, since eventually we're going to get to the prayer at the end of coffee with Father Gray, Today's Saint, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Edith Stein. One of these really very, very interesting 20th century people, uh, especially interesting because of her, she attempted to, she, she wanted to be a professor. She wanted to be an academic, but because of the time in which she lived and other things like that, it couldn't happen. So she was, um, there, there, there are a couple of ways that we can talk about this many of which are rude, but she, well, she was a woman and a Jew and then became a Catholic convert. So in all of these things, not particularly good in Germany in the thirties. So it was pretty bad. Like this is, this whole thing is, is just simply not gonna work very well. Being said, one of her professors, um, Edward Hursorl, the, 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 the guy behind a whole branch of philosophy called phenomenology, which is very cool, uh, was, one of the people who very strongly recommended her that she should be a professor. She recommended that he recommended her to the university as a professor, that he would like to work alongside her to do the work of philosophy. But that was not to be. So she did not get discouraged in all these things. Rather, she actually you know, came to faith and not just as faith, uh, she became a Carmelite nun to live that out very seriously and continued to write. She wrote a couple books uh, taking the philosophy, the metaphysics of Thomas Aquinas and bringing it into a very, really interesting and kind of very cool modern uh, understanding, or modern in the sense of contemporary. If you use modern as a word in philosophy, that means something completely different. But for us, you know, this time that we live in, which was not that long ago, but um, ultimately the world being what it was, she was taken from chapel in the Carmelite monastery, then taken to Auschwitz where she died. Fascinating person, very, very cool person, very much worth looking into, a wonderful example of faithfulness, but also of someone who wants to use the capacity of their mind to the fullest. She's the kind of person who was actually brilliant and not just brilliant for a Carmelite, no, she was brilliant and had a lot to offer the world, but it wasn't the academic work that we have received, rather the example of her life, especially as a martyr. Anyway, just wanted to mention that before going on to the prayers, something to think about today. And someone to look up if you don't know her. Shows She has several names, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Saint. That, that's her name, you know, that was her name in Carmel but her name outside of Carmel was simply Edith Stein. So there you go. All right, as we always do, let's bring our prayers together now and offer them to the Lord that he will hear and answer us. 
for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop, Oscar, and for all bishops, that they find aid from the Holy Spirit in guiding flocks to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Catholic Church, that she be the light of world to all who seek truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For God's people throughout the world, that we find encouragement and grace in our effort to conform ourselves to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our parish, that as we commemorate the Immaculate Heart of Mary this month, we grow closer to loving Christ as she does. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, that they be greeted by Jesus, most merciful. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for who and what else shall we pray? From Linda, for the soul of her grandpa, gone 41 years today, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. From Marissa, for her friend Claire, who is undergoing surgery this morning, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. From Lisa, that the Lord will guide Amy and her family back to Park City safely today, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And from Mercedes, and thanks for the blessing to listen to Brian, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering all our prayers into one, let us offer them in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. God of our fathers, who brought the martyr St. Teresa Benedicta of the cross to know your crucified son and to imitate him even until death, grant, through her intercession, that the whole human race may acknowledge Christ as its savior and through him come to behold you for eternity, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Great. Super. Let's begin this week. But before we do, let's pray some more. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down in mercy on your people who cry to you. And by the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of Saint Joseph, her spouse, of your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, in mercy and goodness, hear our prayers for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother and Church. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Great. Well, special thanks to Brian for this time that he's given us. And of course, we will be praying for you throughout this whole thing. All right. Let us now go and have a nice fun Monday and all the rest of the things that are waiting for us work-wise or et cetera. All right. And we'll see you tomorrow. All right. God bless you all. Bye-bye.